so we are live. Let's give this just a couple seconds. Hello, folks. I see you showing up in here. Welcome. So we're going to give us just a couple seconds. So go ahead and get comfortable, grab a blanket. I am going to go ahead and get started. So hello, everyone. Welcome to our little virtual event space. My name is Allie, and I will be your host for this evening. And I am so excited to be introducing Shelby Forsythia here to discuss her new book, Your Grief, Your Way, A Year of Practical Guidance and Comfort After Loss. So before we get into the good stuff, I just want to quickly thank you all so much for tuning in and for buying books. Your support really is what keeps us going and we really love what we do. So if you also love what we do, we would so appreciate it if you swing by um, or if you're not local, we do ship. Shipping is just $3.50 for the first book and a dollar for every book after that. I will be linking books in the chat all evening so they will be easy to find. Uh, while you are over on our website, I definitely recommend checking out some of our other upcoming events or sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and exciting releases and our online book clubs, which have been really fun. Uh, if you are on social media, of course, follow us. We are on all of the major platforms at their place books and that's the quickest updates and recommendations and you know we have a pretty good time over on our social media so definitely go see if there's anything over there for you so we are here for about an hour and towards the end there will be questions as well as some audience participation uh, if you have any questions which we very much hope that you do go ahead and leave those in the q a box which will be either at the top or bottom of of your screen. It is different than the chat box. The chat is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other, but when it comes time for questions, definitely do try to make sure that those end up in the Q&A so that we can easily find them. And I believe that, that is all of my housekeeping. So without further ado, I am so thrilled to introduce Shelby Forsythia, the author of Your Grief, Your Way, and Permission to Grieve, and podcast host host of Grief Book Review, Grief Seeds and Coming Back, Conversations on Life After Loss. After the death of her mother in 2013, she became a student of grief and set out on a lifetime mission to study the human experience of loss. Her work has been featured in on Huffington Post, Bustle, and the Oprah Magazine. And her newest book, Your Grief, Your Way, is a compassionate, practical roadmap map uh, to assist people on their journey through grief. So thank you, Shelby, so much for being here. I am so excited to be a fly on the wall for this talk. If you need anything, of course, give me a shout. I will be listening, and that goes for everyone in chat as well. I will be here keeping an eye on things, so just let me know. Um, and with that, uh, welcome. Hi there, and hi there, everybody um, who's watching tonight. Thank you, Allie, for that introduction. And thank you, uh, period, to Third Place Books for continuing to operate right now in the time that continues to be COVID and um, for being a local independent bookstore. I love independent bookstores because they're literally hubs of our community. And every time that you purchase a book from a local bookstore as opposed to uh, a mega store or even an, on -time, an online retailer, you're literally helping um, people send their kids to hobbies and activities, you're helping people buy homes in your community and just helping neighborhood programs um, continue to keep going. So local independent bookstores are something really, really close to my heart. And I'm excited to share space with you tonight. Um, it's strange to be excited about something like grief and loss, which I think always throws a lot of people. So thank you for joining me, <clears throat> pardon me, in this space here tonight. Um, I'm an intuitive grief guide, which basically means that I use a combination of intuitive guidance based on my own experience of loss, the death of my mother in 2013. Uh, I was 21 at the time. And uh, a lot, a lot of lot of practical tools, things like mindfulness exercises, things like visualizations, things like reframing to help people return to life after devastating loss. And I'll kind of level the playing field here as we begin and, and let you know that loss includes all kinds of losses. So not just death of a loved one, which we'll talk about a lot tonight, but also things like divorce, a major diagnosis, a pandemic, a major move, job loss, financial loss, etc. So loss kind of is an umbrella of anything where you 
cross through some kind of doorway, something happens in your life and you can't go back the other way. You can't return to how life was before. Something inevitable has happened or something unchangeable has happened. Also natural disasters, things like um, terrorist attacks or wars are very much loss events. And they change either how you see your life, how you see yourself, or both. And then everything that follows, the collection of emotions that follows, is the experience of grief. And what's kind of frustrating um, within our society, and I find this a lot when I work with clients, and this is so much of the reason that I write books about grief, is society gives us like a really narrow margin with which to express our emotions. And they also give uh, society also gives us a really narrow time frame in which to express our emotions. And so most often I hear people say, I feel like I'm only allowed to be sad or I'm only allowed to be angry. And I can only have those quote unquote negative grief emotions for one year. And so any other emotions related to my loss, feeling numb to the world, feeling anxious, not really wanting to go anywhere or do anything. So isolation or maybe even depression is not welcome. People tell me to be strong or to get over it, or they say all these garbage things to me in my loss. And then if my grief goes on for more than a year, there's something wrong with me or I need to be fixed or to be cured. When in reality, anybody who's ever lost somebody, anybody who's ever gone through a major loss knows that grief continues to live with you for the rest of your life. It may exist in different packaging. It may be smaller, it may be rounder, it may be heavier, it may be lighter. It may show up in seasons in greater amounts. So for instance, we just passed Mother's Day and then I'm grieving the death of my mother for almost eight years now this year. And so Mother's Day is a weird time and a hard time to be grieving. And then at other times, uh, my grief feels very small and easy to carry. And I don't know if this is true um, for any of you. Uh, I'll tell you, in writing your grief your way, this is something that came to me literally last year um, in January. I have a very dear friend uh, who works with the folks at Penguin Random House, and they were looking for somebody to write a daily devotional on grief and loss. And the trick was it needs to be non-religious because there are a, a lot of religious devotionals that exist for life after loss. And for what it's worth, myself included, uh, in times of grief and stress, not all of us have a great relationship with the thing that many people call God. And so it's a little surreal that so many devotionals about grief and loss include some kind of higher power. So this is a book absent of all of that, but in its place includes a lot of comforting quotes from people who have grieved. These are other authors. These are other people who are grief experts in the space, as well as practical tips for returning to life after loss. And the reason that it's titled Your Grief Your Way is because you should be able to have the experience of grief and do it on your terms. You should be able to express the emotions that you need to express. You should be able to enact the rituals or the traditions or the practices that speak to or resonate with the loss that you've experienced. And you should also be able to do it on your own time. And, and this includes allowing it to continue on and integrating the experience of grief into your life. So because this is a daily devotional, I'll actually be reading passages from this later, probably in the next like, oh, like seven to 12 minutes or so. So if you have a grief anniversary, this could be the death of somebody that you love, but it could also be their birthday or your birthday or a meaningful day of the year to you. I would love if you dropped it in the chat because I'll literally be flipping through the book at random and reading passages that you request. I'll start with today's date. Of course, we'll start with May 12th. Um, and I'll kind of talk about the the history or the process of writing each of the entries that you request, but I'd love to hear um, some dates that are important to your heart, to your mind, and things that will never leave you, because I know dates are very important in the aftermath of loss. I'm seeing Robin's requesting March 28th, and please just keep filling up the chat with those. I'll get to absolutely as many as I can during our call, because it's such a joy um, to read this work to you and hopefully impart some wisdom on grieving for you. Um, I'll kind of give you a, a show and tell tour guide. I'll put my little hat on. <laughs> And we'll, uh, and we'll go through your grief your way. So this is more or less composed like a traditional devotional with the exception that instead of on each page of having one entry per page, you actually get two. So I'm going to hold this a little bit closer to the camera. And for example, we're looking at March 15th and 16th right here, and then March 17th and 18th right here. And I know you can't see the text, but at the top of each page, there's a quote about grief and loss. And at the bottom of each page, there's a practical exercise that somehow ties into this. And the whole book is structured this way. There are quotes and exercises that literally sister and companion each other throughout the duration of the book. And 
this, this was done intentionally. So you can have days where you rest and kind of absorb a message about life in the aftermath of grief and loss. And then there are days where you practice integrating grief into your life. And these are practical tips like journaling prompts. These are things like um, rituals that you can do with yourself or with others. Even if you have, if you're grieving with kids or if you're grieving with a spouse or you're grieving with other family members or a friend circle, you can absolutely do these exercises with them. Um, and uh, it's really lovely to kind of one day I'm reading this thing and I'm absorbing some new kind of definition or reality or truth about grief. And I'm sitting with that and allowing myself to contemplate that to be true. And then the next day I get to practice something related to grief and loss. I'll answer a common question right now. Um, and is this, do I have to start at January 1st and go linearly all the way through? Do I have to read it front to back like a traditional novel or like a nonfiction book? And the answer is no. This is a book that you can play roulette with, which we'll actually do in a bit when I start reading your quotes. I'm getting April 14th, uh, January 3rd. Please keep dropping your dates into the chat. I would love to keep reading entries for you. Um, <clears throat> this is a book for which if you haven't picked it up in six months, great. Flip it open, even if it's not the day's date that you're looking for. And if you just want to flip open to any page, something on there will be helpful to you in grief and loss. There are a few entries, especially around major holidays like Valentine's Day, Halloween, Christmas, Thanksgiving, that will more or less be pertinent to how do you plan for major days in the calendar year. But the rest of them are really applicable to any time and space when you're grieving. I will give a disclaimer too, in that this book was intended for and written to an audience who has lost a loved one to death. But I've had so many reviews come in on Amazon and Goodreads and IndieBound both or all where people have said, I'm actually using this to get through my divorce. I'm actually using this to reckon with the fact that I've received a diagnosis of a chronic illness and this will be with me for the rest of my life. So this is a book that's intended for and written to people who have lost a loved one to death, but is also being used by people to navigate different kinds of losses, which I absolutely love. So this is definitely a book you can play roulette with, flip it open at any time. And it's also a really neat book if you have a book club or if you're grieving with somebody. So say you're grieving with a spouse or um, you and a friend lost a mutual friend that you knew or something of that nature, you can, you can do this book with another person and it can kind of turn into a miniature grief club. I haven't yet heard of it being in a larger grief book club sense of the word between like eight or 15 people, but I have heard of people doing this in pairs, doing this together and taking notes in the margins and saying, I tried this exercise and it worked for me, or this quote really resonated with me. And it's something you can either do kind of in, in the quiet and privacy of your own home. I'm not ready to share grief with the world yet, but it can also be done in the company of other people who are like, we're grieving together. And so we may interpret these quotes or these pieces of information about grief and loss really differently. Yeah, I'm seeing, um, <clears throat> the uh, the chat fill up with dates. So I'm going to start with Robbins of March 28th. Actually, let's start with today's and then we'll go to March 28th and then we'll do all the rest of the dates that we see here in the chat um, for as much time as we can. And if you have other dates that are important to you, would really love to hear that. And we'll remind you again, if you have questions about returning to life from grief and loss, this is the work that I do as a grief coach and with one-on-one -on -one people through workshops as well. Would love to hear them in the Q&A and anything that you ask now will be saved uh, as a question to ask later. So anything that you'd like to drop in there about how do I tell my coworkers that somebody I love has died? How do I negotiate a relationship with a sibling when we both lost a parent, but the relationship we had with the parent was totally different? Um, what if I want to give this book as a gift, but I'm not quite sure if somebody will want to receive it? Um, all really good questions about grief and loss, and of course, anything else that your heart wants to know. Um, so let's start with May 12th, which is today's date. So this is actually a quote entry at the top of the page. It says, I've learned that I still have a lot to learn. And this is a quote from Maya Angelou. Nothing humbles us like grief. I have yet to meet a grieving person who is also a know-it-all about grief. Grief puts us back at square one, back in elementary school. And we are practically forced to assume a beginner's mind and work through loss from the ground up. Remember that you are not supposed to know how to grieve before grief rolls into your life. You're doing it as you're doing it, and that's exactly how it should be. You still have a lot to learn, but so does everybody else who's grieving. 
And the reason I wrote this entry the way that I did on May 12th is, is um, because so many clients come to me, so many people in workshops relay this concept of, I feel like I'm not doing grief right, or I feel like I'm not doing grief well. And I always counter with, well, who taught you how to grieve? Where did you learn this information about how I'm supposed to grieve or how I should be grieving before the loss actually happened? And more often than not, it's either very minimally from my parents or other adult figures in my life as a child or not at all. And we're not taught as a society, especially in Western society, I'm not sure where all of you are tuning in from, but in westernized society, we're not informed how to grieve. And aside from memorials and funerals, which are rituals for losing a loved one to death, we don't have a lot of practices or a lot of wisdom or knowledge on how to grieve. So as we are grieving a loss, we are learning what it looks like to grieve for us to grieve, what grief looks like for us and the language that we like to use while we're grieving, the habits that resonate with us, the practices that make sense to our brain, the things from our previous life before loss that we'd rather not do or not participate in. And there's there's so much room for this grace and this mercy to fall in of you've never done this before. It's okay that you're new at this. And Brene Brown talks about fucking first times. Grief is a fucking first time. You are doing something you've never done for the first time. And it's really hard by design. Grief is a hard experience. So there's a lot of room to refer to yourself as, okay, I'm back at square one. This is grief 101. This is elementary school. And you can give yourself so much more permission to grieve and to have the experience of grieving. If you enter it from that mindset, instead of it should look like this and I should be this type of person and I'm not allowed to grieve unless it looks like X, Y, Z. So there's a lot more space to allow grieving to exist when you let it be a process that you are learning for the first time. And you can almost look at yourself as an observer in that perspective. It's like, oh, today we're learning that driving by this hospital where they died is a trigger. So maybe we're going to either not do that anymore, or every time we drive by it, we're going to burst into song because that makes us feel better about having to drive by this location where so many hard things happen. So a rewiring of the brain in that practice. Yeah, let's jump over to um, March 28th and you can feel free to please keep dropping dates in the chat and I'll get to as many as I can in this experience. Lovely. So March 28th is at the bottom of the page, which means it's a practical exercise. March 28th says, Taking back our power is a lot more micro than macro. It happens in the moments when we make small, sustainable shifts, not one colossal transformation, which is good for us because every new day is another opportunity to reclaim our power in grief. Try this. For 10 minutes a day, do something that honors your grief. Take a walk, write in a journal, meditate, make art, look at a piece of jewelry or a photo, anything, as long as it honors the fact that you are a grieving person living on earth. Then go live the rest of your day. It may seem laughably small to spend only 10 minutes of your day on grief, but this, these 10 minutes, this 1% of your waking hours, represent a powerful and doable way to reclaim your power, choice, and freedom in the aftermath of loss. And this one is actually inspired by an online course that I led called Life After Loss Academy. Um, and so much feedback that I get from people that I work with is, <clears throat> I feel like I'm so powerless in the face of loss. I feel like the world or grief is a boulder that has just rolled over on top of me and I have no space to breathe. I have no choice in the matter. I am in a place of powerlessness, hopelessness, helplessness, and despair. And this is a really real story to be telling yourself in life after loss. And there's this illusion sometimes, and I think we get this from all the triumph stories we see in movies and the media regarding grief, that one day I'll know what to do and I'll be taking my power back from grief and then it'll be a happy ending and happily ever after. And all of a sudden my life will be good Again, when in reality, rebuilding a life after loss or returning to a life after loss is about these tiny, tiny micro ways that we reclaim our time, that we reclaim our power as people in the face of and inclusive of the fact that we are grieving. And so 10 minutes a day is approximately 1% of your waking hours. So what would you do with 10 minutes of your time to honor the fact that you're grieving? And this is a space that you can start to integrate grief into your life again. And in these 10 minutes, you have choice and you have control of what happens. Are you just laying on the floor and staring at the ceiling? For, for 10 minutes, <clears throat> I will do nothing with regard to my grief. For 10 minutes, I worked with a mother once whose favorite thing to do for 10 minutes was to hold a cameo, uh, uh, like kind of a locket necklace that had a lock of her son's hair in it who died at the age of 25. And she said, I just sit on the edge of my bed with this locket in my hands and breathe 
and honor the fact that he died. Other people like to use a journal, like a journaling prompt, or even to take 10 minutes a day to read your grief your way. And this is how I'm continuing to form a relationship with my grief. But the thing is, whatever it is, I'm choosing what happens. I have the power over what happens within these 10 minutes. And so I am, for lack of better phrasing, the writer of the story for 10 minutes of my day. So if the other 99% of my day feels like I am powerless in the face of grief, this 10% or this 1% of my day belongs to me. These 10 minutes belongs to me. And gradually as you live your life after loss, you can start to expand this time from 10 minutes a day to 20 minutes a day to 30 minutes a day or an hour. Or you'll start to notice other parts of your day, maybe when you're at the workplace, maybe when you're um, talking to family members, when you're like, oh, I'm actually more in control here. I am choosing to do something. I'm making decisions. And that can start to rewire your brain if I actually have a little bit of power and control for how my life after loss goes. And there's this reclamation of, I am a person who can make decisions. I am capable of doing things. And I have some choice in the matter of how I live my life after loss. Thank you so much for requesting that one, Robin. Um, I'm bouncing over to uh, May 28th. And I believe, um, I hope your name is pronounced Neha or Neha, but honoring um, that May 28th is a significant date for you and your grief. So this one's at the top of the page. This one is a quote. It says, start by doing what's necessary, then do what's possible. And suddenly you are doing the impossible. And this is from St. Francis of Assisi. It's hard to live life after loss because we don't forget what life before loss was like. We remember what we were capable of. We remember what we used to do. We even remember how much energy we had in life before loss. And it's easy to shame ourselves into not doing enough when we can't be the people we used to be. Take a deep breath and remember that you have just lived through one of life's hardest and most devastating experiences, the death of a loved one. You cannot be who you were, at least not right away. So start by surviving, then shift your focus to thriving. And this is actually inspired by a conversation I had on my podcast, Conversations on Life After Loss, where um, one of my guests said, in life after loss, I had to start to train myself not to aim for happy or good, but to aim for neutral in life after loss. I just had to figure out how to live again to get to that baseline. And once I got there most of the time, then I could start aiming for happy, which was hard because we don't forget how happy we were or what our life was composed of or all the good things that we knew in life before loss. And it's frustrating that it's like there's a wall there and we can't reach back and become that person again or embody their traits, or characteristics, or even have their energy. And we're like, why can't I just be who I was? Why isn't loss just a thing that happens? Because loss is so much more than a thing that happens. Loss changes our lives, and so we change as a result. So offering yourself this grace to, okay, I just need to be a person who's alive on the earth, and then I can be a person who's alive on the earth and thriving later. Yeah, it changes and shifts your goals and also who you're allowed to be and can be in the aftermath of loss. Um, thank you, Allie and the folks at Third Place Books for requesting uh, April 14th. We're doing a lot of spring dates, I'm noticing, so I'm curious to, to know what that's about. April 14th is also a quote entry. There is no magic cure, no making it all go away forever. There are only small steps upward, an easier day, an unexpected laugh. And this is from Lori Hulse Anderson. There are small moments of grace in life after loss. Take them when they come and acknowledge that receiving grace is part of life after loss. Contrary to what you may believe, these small moments of grace are not a betrayal of your loved one's memory or a sign that things are about to get worse again. You're allowed to experience sunshine every now and then. It doesn't mean you've forgotten about the rain. These small breaths of air, like seeing something beautiful, enjoying a belly laugh at a joke, or really noticing the sun on your face, are reminders that while grief is forever, it is not all there is. There is room in your life for warmth and ease as well. And oh gosh, I cannot tell you in how many interactions with clients and in workshops, people say, I feel so much guilt for being happy or noticing beautiful things or, <clears throat> or pardon me, getting a good night's sleep or laughing at something because I feel like I'm forgetting what happened. I dishonored their memory to which I respond in what textbook or in what rule book does it say that sadness is the only way to honor your people? perhaps laughter or beauty or joy or rest or ease 
is another way to honor them as well. And there's also this, this fear that, okay, if things are good again, then something bad's going to happen again. Grief is very much um, an introducer of anxiety, waiting for the other shoe to drop and being hypervigilant about what's happening in our lives and our worlds again, to which I, I pose this question to my clients of what if this was just a happy thing? What if this was a happy thing that you get to experience and had no deeper fears, trepidation, other meaning attached to it, and you were just simply allowed to have it? What if it was a moment of grace, a gift that was intended for you in this moment, and you were just allowed to receive it, which is another conversation that needs to be had in life after loss is how do we receive? We are so used to output in life before loss, generating things, producing things, giving of ourselves, that grief is often a wonderful chance for us to learn how to receive. Uh, it looks like Jean S is requesting January 3rd. So we'll get a bit into winter here in this one. This is also uh, a quote entry and forgive me because I put in pronunciation when I was reading the audiobook for uh, Your Grief Your Way, which you can find, I believe, on Audible as well as other audiobook outlets. But um, the last name of this person, I may butcher in this moment. <laughs> I had pronunciation guides when I did the audiobook. I do not in the physical copy. The deep pain that is felt at the death of every friendly soul arises from the feeling that there is in every individual something which is inexpressible, peculiar to him alone, and is therefore absolutely and irretrievably lost. And this is a quote from Arthur Schopenhauer, is how I'm going to pronounce that today. <laughs> and uh, the commentary underneath it says, every single person is unique. So when someone we love dies, their mannerisms and idiosyncrasies are forever lost. They cannot be replaced or recreated. And there is massive grief in knowing and recognizing that the person you've lost can never return to you the same way they were present in life. It's okay to acknowledge these feelings and feel heartbroken that your loved one with all of their charms, oddities, and rituals is gone. And this is very much an entry about allowing yourself to grieve the individuality of the person that you lost. Because while, depending on who you lose, I think the world will tell you that it's possible for them to be replaced. Especially if you lost a child, you can always try again, or a spouse you can go out and date again. So these are losses very much so where society will try to instill some kind of hope, heavy air quotes here, in you because that kind of relationship can be replaced. Also heavy air quotes here. When in reality, when somebody you love dies, you have lost this person and all of the things that made them unique and special and meaningful to you in your life, maybe rituals that you shared together, weird quirks that they did. So maybe they... Um, <laughs> Maybe they put their socks on standing up, which is a thing I've seen people do. I'm like, wait, why are we putting our socks on without sitting down to do this? Um, and, and so you kind of lose these, these little bits and pieces that compose the all of who they were when they were on the planet with you. And it's okay to grieve the fact that that is gone. That cannot be replaced. And so that's okay that, the, that that's a reality for you. And that is another valid grief worth having and worth experiencing. Uh, piggybacking off of the thirds, it looks like Jerry is requesting uh, February 3rd. And this is an exercise, so bottom of the page here in your grief your way. Nighttime is a hard time for grief. For most grievers, the dishes are done, the curtains are drawn, and the computer has been powered down. In these quiet end of the day moments, loss has an opportunity to crash right to the forefront of our minds and take over our thoughts. If you find yourself plagued by a bad case of the nighttime blues, consider making a dance it out playlist on your phone or putting on one of your favorite albums. My go-to artists are the twangy all-girl group, The Chicks, the gorgeous ethereal three sister band, Joseph and the jazzy Vince Guaraldi trio. Move and dance your way through the nighttime blues. Don't worry about looking good. This is all about redirecting your brain's attention to your body and moving the energy of grief out through music. And this sounds silly, this can sound like a silly thing to do when you're enormously sad or in a place of great powerlessness or despair, but I think we forget as humans sometimes that while grief is a head and heart experience, it's something that's happening internally, 
psychologically and emotionally within us, it's also happening physically. So grief is an experience that very much inhabits our bodies. We feel physical pain. In the aftermath of loss, some people have phantom pain similar to their loved one after they died. Some people get headaches out of nowhere. Some people are constantly exhausted. Some people have back pain. Shoulder pain is very common. In the aftermath of loss or neck pain, the spine, the thing which supports us um, can be in a lot of pain in the aftermath of loss. And so it's really helpful to move grief out through the energy of music. So even if you're a bad dancer, even if you kind of just sway and don't really dance at all, um, it's a really phenomenal way to allow the energy of grief to move through and possibly even leave your body. I have a very dear friend um, named Sarah Chiswick who leads these things called swamping circles. And they all get together on Zoom right now because of COVID-19. They put all put on the same song <clears throat> wherever they are in the world. And they just dance it out with their video on. <laughs> And it can look like so many things. And the point of swamping or moving these emotions out to music is not to look good, but to allow grief to have its way with your body and then to release so it's not so trapped and held in here all the time. And so especially if nighttime blues for you are a thing, that's a really helpful uh, exercise in the aftermath of loss. Popping over to uh, January 31st, which is literally uh, catty cornered on the page from February 3rd to January 31st. This is a quote entry and actually from another fellow grief author named David Kessler. His works, uh, his books are also very helpful in reckoning with life after loss. This quote says, your loss is not a test, a lesson, something to handle, a gift or a blessing. Loss is simply what happens to you in life. Meaning is what you make happen. And this is from David Kessler. People will tell you all kinds of stories about what your loss means and where your loved one is now. Don't cry, they're in heaven. Look at the bright side, you'll be stronger for this. At least they're out of pain now. Don't believe any of them. Only you can decide what your loss means and where your loved one is now, if anywhere at all. Meaning and purpose are up to you to decide and don't let anybody tell you otherwise. And this is something that's so common in the aftermath of loss is other people try to tell us what our grief means. They tell us that loss has made us stronger as people, which feels false. Grief is not a self-improvement project. They tell us our loved ones are in heaven or they're in a better place now, um, or that they were here on this earth to teach us a lesson or um, that, that we should be grateful somehow for this experience of grief and loss. And, and you don't have to subscribe to any of that. People foist this meaning and, and um, kind of this projection of purpose on top of us in the aftermath of loss, but that we don't have to eat it. We don't have to, to taste what they're serving. We don't have to dine upon the meal that has been placed before us at the table of grief just because somebody else is eating this and it makes them feel better about the person who died or, or the circumstance of loss that we're facing does not mean that we are also required to assign that meaning to our own lives. Let's see. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm a little scratchy today. Um, moving over to May 6th. Yeah, we're living very much in the first half of the book. Uh, and then we'll get to December 13th. I see um, Linda's request as well. So thank you, Caroline. We'll jump over to May 6th which has just passed us. So honoring that May 6th has just passed for you, whatever date and whatever grief anniversary, this is for you. May 6th is from one of my favorite actresses. This is a quote that says, forgiveness means giving up all hope for a better past from Lily Tomlin. Just about everyone dies in the middle of a conversation. There are things left unsaid, actions unperformed, and fences not mended. Whether you need to forgive your loved one or yourself, know that forgiveness doesn't mean being okay with the way things turned out. It simply means that you stop beating yourself up for not being able to make things any different. In forgiveness, you allow yourself or the other person to be human. And forgiveness, I mean, we could write a whole other book. <laughs> on forgiveness in the aftermath of loss. And I'm laughing, but forgiveness is such a hard and tangly topic in the aftermath of grief because it's essentially allowing things to be true. Forgiveness has a lot to do with acceptance and acceptance is not being happy about how things happened. It's simply stating what is true and real in the aftermath of loss, but forgiveness is a part of that. It's like, I forgive you because things were left undone this way. I forgive you because you were not capable of 
knowing any better, knowing any differently, if I have to forgive myself for the things that I said leading up to the aftermath of my mom's death. Um, and the reality of that, and forgiveness is also an ongoing process, but it's giving up this hope that I could have changed something or I could have done something different. And in a way, forgiveness is an act of mercy or an act of grace because you, you take off the boxing gloves you've been trying so hard to use on yourself. And that's a really loving thing to do in the aftermath of loss. And also, it's okay that forgiveness of yourself and forgiveness of the other person who died takes a lot of practice and a lot of effort. So if forgiveness is not coming right away to you in the aftermath of loss, that's really normal and that's okay. Yeah, um, let's uh, jump into the summer to July 17th from Heather. This one is also a quote entry. We're getting heavy on the quotes today. I wanted a perfect ending. Now I've learned the hard way that some poems don't rhyme and some stories don't have a clear beginning, middle and end. Life is about not knowing, having to change, taking the moment and making the best of it without knowing what's going to happen next. And this is from Gilda Radner. Uncertainty is a hallmark of loss. Grief and all of its unexpected twists and turns does a great job of upending any expectation we have that life is predictable or perfect. While it's upsetting and disheartening to realize that life is not always clean and tidy, it's also hopeful in a twisted sort of way. If life isn't perfect, you do not have to try hard to make it that way. You simply have to try your best with the circumstances you're given because nobody knows what's going to happen next. And this can be a little, um, a little bit of like a brain teaser to figure out, because I think especially in life before loss, so many, so many of us subscribe to um, the myth that society feeds us as if you just, or sometimes that religion feeds us as well, and religion's a part of society, that if you just do any, everything right, if you're a good enough person, if you make good enough grades at school, if you climb the right ladders, if you marry the right person, if you have enough kids, if you live in the right neighborhood, right neighborhood, um, that you will have a good life that your life will ultimately be good, that there's some formulaic way to live and be a good person or have a good experience living life on this planet. When in reality, and something grief shows us very starkly, very rudely, is that we never know what's going to happen next. Grief reminds us of the uncertainty that is literally woven into everything that we experience in day-to-day -day life. And in this, it kind of shatters not only every expectation we had for ourselves and for our lives, but this expectation of there is a formula, there is a way to be free from pain, there is a way to be free from loss, there is a way to be free from grief or agony or anxiety or despair or uncertainty or struggle. And so grief bursts down all the doors of perfectionism and this formula of living a quote unquote good life and says, we live in a world where anything can happen. And one way that you can free yourself from pain and pressure in the aftermath of loss is no longer do I have to right the ship. It's not my job in life after loss to get myself back on the prescribed path of a good life, because now I know we live in a world where anything can happen, but to allow it to be true, again, we'll talk about acceptance here, to allow it to be true that we live in a world where anything can happen. So my responsibility, my hope, my expectation can live in a space as big as this moment and no farther. And when you free yourself from this expectation of now I have to continue to live a perfect life, I have to right the ship, I have to get everything back in order, I have to make sure that I'm never in this kind of pain again, while that's a really normal protective response in life after the loss, you can free yourself from that pressure, from that perfectionism by saying, I live in a world where anything can happen, so I will plan for the future, but I will not tie myself or attach myself too much my hopes, dreams, expectations to that, because I know inevitably, because of experience loss, that everything can change in an instant. And so it frees you from this, I don't know, I kind of get um, an experience of a, of a choke cold or, or a, a tight grip of needing everything to be well, good, perfect, right, aligned all the time. When in reality, it's like, grief says that ain't the truth of being human in the world. Uh, thank you to Linda, who's taking us all the way into December. So we're getting some end of the book material here, December 13th. This one is an exercise, so here at the bottom of the page here. It says, sometimes it feels like all our friends and family want from us. Ah, this piggybacks off the, the last entry really well. Sometimes it feels like all our friends and family want from us is the certainty of a happy and put together future. 
We're peppered with questions like, when are you going to start dating again? And so are you going back to school? And will you have another kid then? While it's clear that they want us to be happy, it hurts to feel pushed into a future that we're not sure of yet. When someone asks you about your future plans, try saying, I'm doing my best to live each day as it comes. I see what you're getting at, but I'm not ready to jump that far ahead right now. See if this statement helps you lovingly set boundaries between you and those eager to gaze into the crystal ball of your future. And this can have a lot to do with people trying to make meaning out of your loss too. They want to know that you're going to have a happy ending. They want to know that something in your life is going to be good again. It makes them feel better about the pain that you're struggling with right now. And it, it gives them some kind of hope. But your job as a griever is not to give other people hope about your future. Your job as a griever is to navigate the experience of loss, feeling all the things that come being all of the new identities that grief is forcing you to be and slowly reconstructing what your life actually looks like in life after loss. And so when people say things like, are you going to date again? Don't worry, you can have another kid. And, and um, <clears throat> I feel like it's time for you to go back to grad school. Have you applied yet? You can respond with, I, I see what you're getting at. I know you want my future to be good. And thank you for having that wish for me. But also in this moment, for the time being, you can use these prepositional temporary phrases right now. I can see as far as today and maybe tomorrow or maybe the end of next week. So my vision because of loss is only going so far. And that's, that's a way I'm protecting myself right now. That's a way I'm caretaking for my future self is by really only focusing on what I'm experiencing right now today. And this is a thing that you'll find a lot in, in your grief, your way is these are not just exercises for, for you to carry out in life after loss, but they're also exercises in which you can learn to set boundaries with other people in your grief. You can learn how to call upon friends or family for help in life after loss. It integrates other people into the experience of your grief because grief doesn't happen in a vacuum. Grief emotionally doesn't happen in a vacuum. You're sharing emotions with other people in the world who are grieving, but also grief logistically doesn't happen in a vacuum. We are all interconnected humans, even and especially in this time of COVID, where we are relying on other people to process our grief with, and we are experiencing life um, with other people who may also be grieving the same person that we lost. One of the other entries in this book that um, I really love, and I don't remember what entry it is. It's very hard because I remember all the things I wrote in here or most of the things I wrote in here, but I just don't remember what day they were. <laughs> Um, is an entry about offering a disclaimer before sharing your grief story with other people, because such a great fear that grieving people often have that they come to me with, especially women or female identified people, because we're so socially um, <clears throat> taught or groomed to not be a burden to others, is I feel like when I share my grief story with other people, or I'm telling people about the hard day I'm having, or I'm letting them know all the ways this, this tradition is changing since the death of my loved one, I feel like I'm asking people to carry a burden that's not theirs. I feel like a burden in my grief and loss. I feel like people don't wanna hear what I have to say. I feel like I'm making them sad when I don't have to. And so these all this like emotional baggage that comes with potentially sharing our grief story with other people, which is a real and true thing. So especially, <clears throat> pardon me, kind of always, but especially right now in this time of COVID when everybody is navigating so much on their plate and we are not being given breaks by our, by our workplaces, by society, by, um, the, by the schools that we might attend or by the people that we're surrounded by. We're not given as much opportunity to rest as we actually need in this time. Everybody's been worn very thin right now. And so to place your emotional needs onto another person, there can be a very real fear of, I'm going to be a boundary, uh, a boundary. I'm going to be a burden to them. They're not going to want to hear what I have to say, or I'm going to make them feel sad, or they won't want to talk to me anymore because when I address them with my grief, um, it's too heavy for them to carry. And so there's an entry in here somewhere. Again, I can't remember what day it is, <laughs> but you'll find it when you read it and order it, please, from third place books. Um, you'll find it when you read it. There's this entry about offering a disclaimer for your loss because friends and family don't always have that capacity to carry what we have. So saying something along the lines of, um, saying something along the lines of like, do you have a moment I want to share a story about my mom with you? Or is it okay if I check in with you later this week and let you know how I'm doing? Or, um, or I'm having a hard day on this end. Is it okay if I rant to you? Can I unload this with you? Can you be a container for this today? And in that moment, what you're doing is offering your friends and family an opportunity to opt in to the experience of your grief. 
you are allowing them a choice of whether or not to support you in that moment. And if they say something like, um, I have this really important presentation at work today, but I'd love to catch up later. What they're telling you in that moment is, yes, I have a place that's safe for your grief, just not right now. And so you are allowed to have these conversations with them later. If they totally shut down and say, I don't want to hear about your grief. It's too sad for me to talk about. I can't believe you're using me as an outlet for this not a safe place for your grief. And so in the ways that friends and family respond to your grief and loss, you can even decide and determine, okay, who are my people? Who's my community? Who are the people that I can lean on the best or the most in the aftermath of loss who have room for me as a grieving person and as somebody who's having all of these experiences together? Yeah, um, kind of reminders, we're getting into the last um, 15 minutes of the call, would really love for um, you to submit questions in the Q&A uh, because we have so few people on here as well. Would love to um, have you submit them in the chat also. Yes, yes, that would be lovely. Um, First question coming in here, uh, is my sister passed in 2018 at the age of 57 of metastatic cancer? I'm so sorry. My mother died in 2020 last year at age 93. It's been very difficult to speak to friends about it after the first year. Yes, because there's that societal expectation of you should be over it by now. I found an online bereavement group to talk about everyone's loss of loved ones. Yes, and this is actually another tip that shared in your grief your way is sometimes physical spaces and or the friends and family that we normally rely on for other kinds of emotional support before life after loss may not be our people in life after loss. There's a, a strange phenomenon that happens. I don't believe this is scientific or psychological in study, like in any kind of evidentiary way, but something I found in my own grief after the death of my mother and something that I see so commonly with the clients that I work with, with workshops that I lead, um, is that my family is not a good support system for me, whether they are also grieving the same person. So especially um, with the loss of a sister, with the loss of a mother, these are familial losses. So other people in your family, if they're alive or if you're connected to them, so like uh, another parent or grandparent figures or maybe siblings of um, other siblings or other uh, aunts and uncles and, and other people and, and cousins and people in the family, these might not be your best support systems because they are also kind of tilting inward towards the person that was lost. And so oftentimes we have to go to what's called outer rings of the circle. So maybe um, second and third cousins or great aunts and uncles, people who are slightly more removed from the person that was lost, but also Maybe there's a grief support group at your workplace that you could go to. Maybe um, there's an online support group that you can find for life after loss, which is why I host the workshops and online grief support that I do, because it's like, this is a safe place for your grief. This is a designated zone where your grief is allowed. You're allowed to share your story. You're allowed to ask your questions. You're allowed to have hard days. And they are not experiences that you are required to share with your family. And also, I want to validate as well that there is another kind of grief in that and not being allowed to grieve, not being allowed or maybe not feeling welcome grieving with your friends and family that you would normally have these emotional experiences with. So especially for this person grieving after the first year, it's like, my friends and family are tired of hearing about it. I have found a place that continues to welcome my stories in life after loss. So that's a really lovely tip to share. And there's actually some websites and grief uh, resources that I share here in the book that might be really helpful for finding community in life after loss. Um, a uh, question here says, do you also have podcasts uh, and topics? So I host three podcasts right now. There's one launching this Friday called Grief Seeds. And these are like about 15 minute podcast episodes where I offer one tip from uh, interactions with clients or workshops that I've led for reframing your grief and loss. So kind of think of it as your grief your way, but in podcast form. Um, so every time I've had some kind of uh, shift with a client where we phrase things a certain way that's been helpful to them, or it's an exercise or a tool that they've really loved hearing about and has been transformative in their grief and loss, I'll hop on the mic for about 10, 15 minutes and share that tip with you and offer a tiny little meditation to send you into the world at the end of the podcast episode. My longest running podcast so far called Coming Back Conversations on Life After Loss is an interview format podcast where I long form about an hour for each episode, talk to really... Um, prominent figures in the grief space. So fellow authors, fellow grief experts, and also just like normal people about what it's like to have a loss. And we cover everything from death, which is probably the most common covered on the episode, to divorce, to diagnosis, to job loss, to financial crisis, to things like abuse and miscarriage, which are lesser talked about. Also things like suicide, um, terrorism, natural disasters, things that kind of get less, uh, for lack of better phrasing, airtime in the grief space. You'll find a lot of conversations there about life after loss. And you can find that wherever you listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify. And if you're um, 
but not too tech savvy, they're also available as full episodes on YouTube. So you can pop over uh, to my YouTube channel and subscribe and you'll get notifications when each of those goes live. Um, I've had the joy of interacting with um, authors like Cheryl Strait, talking about the loss of her mom, um, Rob Bell talking about the loss of his grandmother, and so many other people in the grief space um, that have just shared their stories about life after loss. Yes, yeah. And then there's another podcast coming out that all of you especially might appreciate called Grief Book Review. And this one's launching later this year where I literally uh, review grief books in 10 minutes or less. And that's one where I've got such a stockpile. I've got a library of grief books in my brain that I've read in the past six or seven years since my mother's death. And there's ones I love more than anything and recommend the most often in my work. And this will be a place where those grief books get shared and also a place where grief books, especially by marginalized people. So people of color, queer folks, um, and men who weirdly are kind of downplayed in the grief space will be shared in a space that's uplifting to them and to their work. Because right now, um, especially in the publishing space for grief and loss, it's overwhelmingly white, cisgendered, straight, and female. There are a lot of memoirs about what it's like um, to be a widow, and there are a lot of memoirs about child loss, and they're all from the perspective of straight, white, cisgendered women. And while I fit some of those criteria, not all of them, um, there is so much room for and a need for to talk about other stories of grief and loss. So it'll be a podcast that highlights really well-loved and popular books about grief, but also ones you may not have heard of um, from marginalized people who do not have as much of a voice or as much of a platform right now in the grief space. Um, popping over to um, Q&A, got a question that says, we lost my brother to suicide last year and I've been trying really hard to respect my parents' boundaries with grief. My dad is slowly opening up now and it seems like this book might be a good thing for him. How do you go about providing tools to someone while also respecting their boundaries or is it just not possible thank you i love this question because there it's it's lovely that you have this inherent respect you're like i see that you are also grieving and i don't want to trample on what that experience is like for you and also i care that this is something that you're integrating into your life that you feel like you're healing from for as much as we will never be healed healing is a, a constant process that we all undergo yeah i think pardon me, going into this um, conversation about offering a disclaimer again might be really helpful. Something I use with my clients all the time and even in conversation with friends and family is kind of just this opening um, line of, I don't know if this is gonna be helpful to you, but I wanted to offer you this because it was helpful to me or because it seemed like something you would resonate with. So I don't know if this resonates with you. I don't know if this is gonna be helpful to you. I don't know if you're actually going to pick this up and read it, but it made me think of you or it made me wonder if it would be something that would be applicable to where you are in your grief right now. And I wanted to give this to you as a gift. And it's really important um, <clears throat> as you offer people resources in the aftermath of loss to indicate that you have no expectations of how they use it or if they use it at all. So sometimes people um, sometimes people will give the gift of a book with the expectation that you read it by next week and then get back to them. Have you met these people? <laughs> They're like, I gave you a gift of a book. I'm like, I have 50 books on my shelf that I haven't read yet that I'm still trying to get through. So um, unless your book is one I've been dying to read, it will not be my top priority at the moment. I'm going to be getting to it eventually, maybe, but this expectation. So, so as you give the gift of a book, especially something like your grief, your way, um, free yourself from the expectation that your dad will even use this at all. And so the gift should be given. And if you have to sit with this in some kind of meditative form or even journal about it before you give the gift of this book, it's like, you could even do some kind of exercise of dad. I release you from any expectation that you use this or read this or, or resonate with this at all. It's okay if you re-gift it. It's okay if it collects dust on the shelf. The intent that I want to give it with is this might be helpful to you because it was helpful to me. And if this resonates with you, great. If this starts conversations with us, great. And something that might be helpful to you too is like, I got the book and I'm reading through it and it's helpful to me. Or maybe earmark a page that you're like, this is really resonant, or this is applicable to something that we did as kids, or this is something that we share, or this is something that's funny, might be a really good jumping in point. Or even just marking um, the day that your brother died, or even marking your birthday, or your dad's birthday, or a significant date that you both share is kind of just like a post-it in the book, or writing a note, or, or something like that. There's so many ways to introduce this um, to him that is, hmm, I want to use the phrase non-threatening, but also without the weight of pressure or expectations. So don't call your dad next week and be like, so did you get a chance to check out that book? You could say something when you give the gift of, of um, 
if you, if there's something in there you like, I'd be really open to talking about it. So like my door is always open to you, or I resonated with this passage. You might too. I'd love to know what you think. Should you care to pick it up? Yeah. But without this expectation or this weight that this is how he's going to do his grief. Cause the thing about your grief, your way <laughs> is that everybody's going to do their grief, your, their way. And I'm laughing about it, but especially in families, this can cause some discordance of not everybody feeling like they're on the same page because everybody's grieving wildly differently. And so your dad may not grieve through books. And that's okay. And also this might be about knowing your dad too. Would an audiobook be more pertinent or even an ebook, which is this, this is available in or something like an interactive online course. So it may not even be something that's static or um, you sit and absorb it like a book or something like that. It might be something more interactive, but yeah, it might open the door to further conversation. And if, if you give the gift of a book and it is firmly rejected, <sighs> grieve that as a reality. My father's rejecting my gift and there's a grief in that, especially because it's a grief uh, related to the suicide of my brother, which is also a grief in and of itself. And also say he's, he's grieving in his own way and maybe I don't need to participate in that or maybe he doesn't want me to participate in that right now. And you can use that temporary language in this moment right now for the time being and offer yourself these opportunities to continue to check in with him maybe a month from now, maybe six months from now as you both kind of orbit around each other like grief satellites having had the same loss, lost the same person. Well, for him, loss of a child, for you, loss of a sibling, very different losses actually, but losing the same person within your life and then figuring out how to grieve your way in each of it. Yes. Um, next question says, I feel called to become a grief coach, but I'm still dealing with my spouse's loss nine months ago. How do you know when you've dealt with your grief enough to help others with their own grief? Ah, this is really common. Um, okay. So there's some practical answers to this because I didn't become um, a grief coach or an intuitive grief guide until about three, three and a half years after my mother's death. And only now has it really ramped up into a full-time business. So this is something I do um, full-time. I've had other jobs in the restaurant industry and in the floral industry um, in addition and sistering kind of with my grief work. And so I've always kind of been doing something else on the side. This is the first time that I'm doing this and only this. And so there's a lot, it kind of depends on whether or not you want to turn it into a business, which many people do. And so there's the whole entrepreneurial aspect of business licensing and getting certified and kind of feeling like you've done enough research. And it also depends on what kind of products you put into the world. So are you grief coaching? Are you writing books? Are you doing podcasts? How are you, how are you sending your coaching out into the world? Like, how are you offering it? as a service to people. Um, and so there's the logistical aspect of it. And then there's also kind of the grief half of it. How much energy do you have right now? How much, um, I don't necessarily want to phrase it this way, but like self-discipline or adherence to a schedule or, or a timeline. How much time do you have for administrative work right now? How much bandwidth do you have in your head and your heart for these things that absolutely will need to be done at some point uh, if you're going to become a grief coach. Can you answer emails for a pretty long time right now? And that's actually, it sounds funny, but that's actually a real question to ask yourself in your grief. Are you willing to manage social media? Like, how do you want this to appear to the world structurally? Um, so how do you know when you've dealt with your grief enough to help others with theirs? So really there's no there's no set time frame for that is the answer to that question. It's more, especially for me, like an energy thing. Do I feel like I am healed enough? You'll never be fully healed. Healing is an ongoing process, just as growing is an ongoing process. Um, there's a beautiful book called Women Who Run With the Wolves. And there's a story in there about being a wounded healer. And all grief coaches I've met our wounded healers. We have had our own experiences of loss. And so we heal on behalf of others from a place of our own wounds. Um, it's an energy thing. So if you feel like at nine months after the loss of my spouse, I am ready to support other people in their grief, have at it. And also know that the administrative bits and bobs of it will also come entailed. Um, this might be something though, where you could get in contact with other grief coaches, or you might consider being grief coached yourself in this arena. So being coached by a grief coach on when is a good time to become a grief coach. It's very meta. <laughs> Perspective grief, grief coach gets coached by a grief coach on when to become a grief coach, but kind of um, noticing these boundaries and noticing kind of where these um, areas are within yourself. Also, in addition to becoming a grief coach, you want to make sure that you're coaching in a way that is not, hmm, how do I phrase this in a, in a way that makes sense? 
I'm not coaching to express my own pain, although sharing my story different than expressing my pain is a part of the work I do. People want to know how I got here. People want to know about the wounds that created the wounded healer. So maybe um, somebody like a storytelling coach or somebody like a, like an entrepreneurial coach would be a really good person for you to meet up with or link up with to start off. Um, and I have resources for that. If you'd like to email me, Shelby at shelbyforsythia.com or also hit up the contact page on my website, um, shelbyforsythia.com is a great place to go for that. I also do business coaching. If that's a thing that resonates with you, helping grieving people start their businesses, another conversation for another time, but you want to make sure that as a grief coach, you are relaying your story, but it is not a place where here's where I'm dumping all of my pain. You don't want your clients to be the recipient of that. So yeah, I might consider ent entering into some spaces where grief coaches already are and exist and possibly being grief coached yourself. So you can be like, oh, this is what this is like. And also as you do the work of your own grief to continue to take note of like, these are the things that are helpful to me. These are the mindfulness practices. These are the reframings. These are the, the stories that I've started to tell myself um, about grief and loss that are helpful and literally start making like a little notebook of these are the tools that I'll use eventually when I become a grief coach. And of course, if there are things that other people wrote, um, especially if they're people of color or minorities in the grief space or marginalized people in the grief space, be sure to attribute um, their work back to them. I um, am doing business coaching right now for somebody who's also becoming a grief and transformation coach. And she was so afraid. She's like, I feel like I have to have all the answers about grief and loss. And I said, what, what your goal is, is not to be the generator or the creator of all the tools in grief and loss, but sometimes to be the transmitter of tools that already exist. So it's not your job to have all the answers, but oftentimes, especially with coaching, it's to know 10% more than the people that you're talking to. Just get them a little bit farther on the path that they're already on. And also, as you consider becoming a grief, a grief coach, respecting the energy that you have, the loss of your spouse, how will they be incorporated? into your grief coaching space and kind of what voice do you want to have and what products and services would you like to offer up to the world as a result of your grief coaching? Yes. Yeah. Um, that looks like all the questions I have in this space. And I know we're hitting at the hour. Um, anything else, Allie, that you'd like from me or to uh, share from anybody else in the space? I think that this is pretty much the end of our evening. I have just one more question for you. Yes. And I think you've sort of answered some of this, but what is on the horizon for you and what should we look out for in the near future? I love when people ask this question because <laughs> I always have something I'm turning around in my brain. Um, I think I'm going to publish like 22 books before I die. Um, so the next book that I'm writing is actually a book for people who are companioning grieving people. So people like pastors, nurses, funeral home directors. And it's, what do I say to comfort the grief? Grieving, which is a question I get so often, is there I, I'm face to face with a grieving person, they're sharing their loss story with me. And as soon as they share that loss story with me, it's like the gears turn in my head and it's error 404, response not found. It's something happens where um, when we are asked to be containers for other people's grief stories, we're like, that's so hard, that's so sad, that's so bad. And we're overwhelmed by the by the bigness of grief, which is really normal that we don't know what to say. And so there's three phrases that I've used in my work with clients um, for the past four, four or five years or so. And consistently people come back and say, this is helpful. This has changed my life with grief. And even as people are comforting themselves, so this is a book for people who are comforting the grieving, but also grievers who are self-comforting or self-parenting, if that's language that you'd like to use. Um, these are things that you can emotionally validate yourself with as you are going through a loss. And it's not the, the stereotypical or the cliche, they're in a better place, or God never gives you anything you can't handle, or everything happens for a reason. It's tossing all those garbage phrases out the window and giving you real practical, emotionally validating words where you can sit with somebody in their grief and they can feel like you've heard them and you feel like you've had the right thing to say. That is so useful, I think, especially as this year has given us a lot of global grief to sort of contend with. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Everyone in chat, it was so wonderful to see you here. Thank you so much for your uh, comments and questions and participation. And I think that this is where we say good night. So as always, we've reached the point where I say, let the awkward waving commence. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Okay, I can do that. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shelby. <laughs> good night, you. everyone.